Welcome to Indiana Sports Beat Radio, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Looks over the middle, second guesses, fires, throws, does he make the catch in the end zone? Yes! Touchdown! Oh, the to win it. Another one! Another it. one! Another one! Utah, he's at the 30, he's going to go! 10, 5, touchdown! Jonathan Taylor! Galloway finds Rob Finnessy, who fires the three, and... Oh! Now, from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios, here's your host, Jim Coyle. Hello, I'm Jim Coyle. Welcome to another edition of Indiana Sports Speed Radio. Coming to you from high atop the 18th fairway here at the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios on this Tuesday, April 4th. Hope you're having a great start to your day. Don't forget, Indiana Sports Speed Radio, powered by Andy Moore Honda. Just go to AndyMoreHonda.com to get more to your door and the Endeavor Hospitality Wealth of Restaurants in and around the Bloomington area. Great places like BB's Market, your butcher, baker, no matter where you live. Welcome aboard. Uh, expect another great show today. Uh, Mike DeCourcy will join us. Chronic Hoosier will join us. We've got the national championship to talk about, the Masters to talk about. Bob Knight was released from the hospital. We'll talk about who's on top for 23-24. Um, but first, I want to talk about uh, yeah, Bob Knight. That was uh, getting released. Legendary Indiana men's basketball coach Bob Knight has been released from the hospital after being admitted over the weekend with an illness, according to to a statement from his family yesterday. His family asked for privacy, adding that he is cared for and resting at home in good hands. Coach always taught us and those that played for him the importance of fighting through adversity, and he and our family, thank you for the tremendous amount of support we have you have shown and given during this time. The statement said, we appreciate your continued thoughts and prayers. Of course, uh, Coach Knight, was the coach at Indiana for 29 years, 11 Big Ten championships, 24 NCAA tournament appearances, three national titles, and, of course, the last undefeated squad that went 32-0. and And actually, they went, what, 63-1 and over that mark, 36-0 and in the Big Ten during that, that period. Uh, so, good to hear. Great to hear that uh, he is out of the hospital and back at home. So good for Coach Knight. Of course, last night, you had the national championship. Did you watch that, John? I caught glimpses of it. I was out of Top Golf uh, as it was getting as it was getting started. Um, but I mean, it seemed like it played out the way that everyone said it was going to. UConn did exactly what uh, they did the rest of the tournament. I mean, they're one of the only teams, at least that I can recall in recent memory, that have taken care of business in every single game they play leading up to winning the national championship. They're one of six teams to win every game by 10 points or more that is in, their tournament, in their tournament run. One of and six how many ever- of those other teams were were better than a four seed? I bet most of them were. I I'd say they all were, but I'd have to pull that up. That's a really good question, but I will, we'd have to pull that up, but uh, yeah, they, they did. They just took care of business. There was not a game that they looked most of the time. Well, that's why it's only one of six teams. Generally, every team that makes a run through the NCAA tournament has a close call because they're, it, they're, it, it takes luck. It, not for this UConn team. They didn't need luck. They took care of business, uh, like John said. Uh, they they won every game by 10 points or more. Uh, and like I said, generally, you've got close games. It's just the nature of the beast, especially with this tournament. So the fact that they're able to escape this tournament and not have any close games when everyone else is getting beat or it's – it shows that how much of a team UConn was, how together they were, how well they played together. 
great job by uh, Danny Hurley. So congratulations to uh, Danny. And UConn. UConn wins their fifth national championship. Uh, this is going to be hard for you to hear, Hoosier fans. Since 1999, um, That's 25 that means, years. Or 24 means years, excuse me. Yeah, That means they've won all five. They've won five national championships now, the same as Indiana. But on the thing that Indiana fans are not going to hear, they've won all five of those since Indiana has won their last national championship. Do I consider UConn a, a, a blue blood? It's hard to say no, but I call them a new blood. I think it's a cool term too, because I mean, it, because it they were they were they were not part good. of the history of college yes. basketball. But they in weren't terms good in the forties, the fifties. You know, Indiana's got a title in forty, in fifty three, uh, in the seventies. My God, of course, the eighties, the night. Same with Kentucky, uh, North Carolina, Kansas. You go back, way back with these teams, years. That's why they're called Blue Bloods. And UConn's a new blood. Um, you can almost say, though, that, I mean, I guess alongside Duke, since the 90s, they're the, either the first or second most successful college basketball program. Uh, absolutely. Five national championships, <laughs> you're not going to beat that. They're leading the way of the, the new blood uh, era. I don't know if any. I guess Villanova tried to be a part of that for a few years. They still got a ways to go with that to catch up to UConn. But yeah, but the man that led that architect, that's true, Mr. Archi Jay Wright, he's on the side. And that's another thing too. Now. UConn's done this with three different head coaches, right? That's that's the utterly most amazing part of this in that period of time because uh, it has been three completely different situations, not just three coaches. It's been three completely different programs at the moment that they won the national championships. I mean, what Jim Calhoun had going was completely different than what Ka Kevin Ali did and which was completely different than what Danny Hurley did. It's amazing. Um, so there's that. Hey, a big shout out again to Toast coach Tom Crean for uh, joining us yesterday. That was just such a fun conversation. Uh, what a great affable guy. Um, as just as a basketball analyst, as a basketball person, just very nice, genuine, genuine, uh, genuine with this generous with his time. And we're grateful for that. And uh, this was a great couple of segments yesterday. So uh, we're going to make sure we get all of those out separately for you so uh, listen to those and he had some great words for terry moore and man i mean he wouldn't let me go until we talked about terry moore uh we actually went over yesterday no, he held us hostage uh which is great i've <laughs> never had that happen and i love it uh i'll do it all day long now it drives it drives john crazy because he's the one that has to deal with this uh, as the producer <laughs> And then you've got me that I'm like, oh, I don't care. You find a way to deal with it because this is good stuff, man. So this is the this is the fight that that goes on, not real fight, but this is the struggle that goes on behind the scenes that you guys don't understand. And we did Hot find a way. For those of you who listened on radio, you actually didn't hear the Terry Morin segment, so you'll have to go back and listen to that portion on YouTube. But the YouTube YouTube stream obviously saw, saw the entire thing. Yeah. Well, as soon as you get that cut, I'll I'm gonna. Send of course, yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna send out the clip today for from the I'll, Terry Morin segment. I'll tweet that out. But yeah, yeah, it was very very nice to him. I mean, he went out of his way. We we were done, and he was like, "Oh, we we we've got to talk about Terry Moore and the job she's doing." And it was a ten minute conversation, and it was more about him making sure he wanted to make sure that the administration she's going into a contract year. Um. It's going to cost Indiana some money. Keep Terry Moore. Uh, well, deservedly so. I, as a matter of fact, I looked yesterday at Lisa Bluter at Iowa. She makes around 1.3, 1 1.4. 1 um, you're going to have to be in that neighborhood. You I might not have... 
It makes it's going to be a million. It's going to be over a million. I can tell you. Damn, it's sure a good problem that. to have. But now Scott Dolson's got to be able to manage uh, the contract for women's basketball. He's already been trying to manage it with basketball or uh, men's basketball. I mean, obviously, I guess he. It's not such a big a deal in football right now with uh, the the come up that Tom Allen saw us to resurge. I guess, but the more success you have, the more you got to pony up the the money to these successful head coaches. Leslie said, whoever thought of the term blue blood needs to settle the debate. Leslie, I settled it. Come on, man. Give them a hard definition. She doesn't trust me. Well, there is a. We all know what we know what it is. There's no definite. We know what it is. Uh, But I I think some people and and I I used to be guilty of thinking this, too, like thinking that blue blood just meant that you're the cream of the crop where where it's really just referring to old money, the cream of the crop historically. Yes, this it's this uh, it's more about historic stuff, historic money, historic. Yeah. Long, long, long time. So, no, they would not be considered a blue blood. They're they're just because they're extraordinarily successful does not make them a historically successful team but they're as successful as anybody they're one of six teams now that has five national championships including indiana i think north carolina is in that category kansas is in that category north carolina may be one above it i can't remember um it's new bloods not new not new version of blue blood it's new blood dang it that's a great phrase that i coined uh, just messing. Uh, is there a better coach in America than Danny Hurley? Eh. He did a He's, great job. The day he is, I, I think Dusty May did a did as good a job. He just got beat by a shot uh, with guys that aren't good. But yeah, Hurley, excellent job, excellent, excellent job. I mean, he had his team ready. They they just played the same. Uh, he did an unbelievable. He's that's your coach of the year right there. I mean, that's the coach of the year. That's why they should wait until this these tournaments are over to vote for this stuff. In my opinion, uh, let's see. Up, uh, let's see. I wanted to pull up who's going to be. Uh, the the way too early. Here we go. And then we'll break right after from that. the athletic. The NCAA men's way too early top twenty five. All right, boy, we'll Let's be able to it. guess who's number one. This is going to surprise you. What conference are they from? The Big East. It's not you. I mean, UConn's in the Big East. Are they going to give UConn the number one nod for next year? No, it's Marquette. Really, they I'm must about, be returning a lot. About, I mean, they've got Marquette over Purdue. Why would Purdue? Purdue, absolutely. We, we've even discussed this a million times. Purdue does not deserve to be in that top echelon. In my top opinion, season. I agree with that. But these are these national people. They get. They're all. They're all hung up on Zach Eady. Uh, well, they say the big question is, is, is Big Maple, Edie, the reigning national player of the year, has not yet announced if he, he's not going to the NBA draft. He's not. Do you see him on a, a – where do you see him on a mock draft board? He's not. He's not going anywhere. we got to take a break. Plenty more to talk about, including Mike DeCourcy joining us next, Chronic Hoosier later, the Masters. Starts later this week as well. We got lots more coming up. Back with it right after this. We'll be right back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. If you're in the market. All right. Oh, I've got to get uh, Mike Glasgow on. Too, that top golf stuff was pretty fun last night. I'd never gone to it before. Oh yeah, I've never been. I bet it was. We should have talked about it. I was pretty that, bad at it though, but it was still fun. 
that's what it's for. It's bad. That's where that's where all bad golfers should go. They should not come to the damn golf course, <laughs> dude. Uh, whenever we have a break, we have to talk about that. Yeah, that's fine. That's exactly what that should be for. That's for if you want to take your girlfriend who doesn't play golf, or if you want, or if you want to take your boyfriend who doesn't play golf, go there. I was just one thing I was hoping for that I didn't see last night is for some dumbass to throw their club across the across the plane and into the playing field. I wonder if that's happened. Oh, I'm sure it has. I just didn't see it last night. Have you heard about it happening? Uh, not like anything hard, like or definitive or anything. But I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure it's happened uh, enough. Uh, enough of the drinkies. You never know what can happen. Drinky drink. Man, I need a three arm. I. <clears throat> Oh, let's see. All right, we've got about one minute. I'm sure Mike will be here shortly. He may join mid-segment. Try to be done with the second segment of Mike as close to 940 as you can, because I know sometimes you go along with him. I just like to keep us on track. If if we can, I understand if you're all super into something and you can't stop, but do your best. Appreciate you. All right. I'll bring us back in. I'm sure he'll be here in a minute. Brewing. Metalworks Brewing Company is the culmination of a passion for beer, food, and custom metal art. Check out their custom growlers. Metalworks Brewing Company has an updated menu, new brews, and will be offered in all Endeavor Hospitality restaurants. Come taste with Dr. Hops' Brewing. Metalworks Brewing Company. Bring your passion and your thirst. This segment is brought to you by Southern Stone Restaurant. Now back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coy, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Tuesday, April 4th. I hope you're having a great day. I don't think the weather's going to be so great today. I think it's going to be uh, in and out, but of course that depends upon where you are. Here in central Indiana, I think it's just going to be a little hit and miss. Uh, I have a meeting immediately afterwards with our friends with Never Lose Hoop, which, man, never, it's not that far away, it seems like. It's just right back here. It, it just seems like yesterday we, we had that event. Of course, Never Lose Hoop golf outing um, for the Holes Foundation. Started by JC and Joni Hulls, and uh, now Jordan Hulls carrying that on. So looking forward to working with them on that again this year, and we'll be letting you know all of that information as it comes up. I know it's, it looks like we're going to be look, uh, hitting June 8th as the date. It's a Thursday. So keep that date in mind. And we made sure to... Uh, Planted on a free day, so we are expecting a lot of Indiana basketball environment. Uh, it's going to be nice down in Evansville, Justin says, for all these, all of you all listening on the ref 977, always the right call. Appreciate everybody down there. Our river rats, our region rats up in uh, the northwest part of the state, listening on WJLB. 12.30 a.m., 104.7, and all into Chicago. Hello, hello, Chicago. How are you all doing today as well? And uh, wherever you might be, we appreciate you guys. 
let's see. What was I going to talk about? Who? What? Oh, yeah. Creighton. Let's see. Purdue is number two. We're going back to uh, the too early. I'm going to check this out. Are we looking at the, the, the athletics? Yes, it is from the athletic. Um, Here comes Mike. Okay. Mike, give me like the he's in a nice. He looks like he's in a. I thought you were in a, a robe in a in a nice in a nice suite in at some place, Mike. <laughs> ah, come on, man! You got to be realistic here. <laughs> How's uh, how is Houston or how was Houston? It was Houston. Uh, yeah, the final four. It kind of it came down like John said earlier. It kind of came out to be what we thought, but there's more to it. A lot more. I was reading your story today about the Hurleys and and man, they have been a part of college basketball of our part of part of our college basketball, at least mine, for a long time. I mean, I'm thinking which and even further back than I know of because, of course, I my memory was started with Bobby Hurley and Duke. Uh, but I know that there was more to it, but I, I, we don't, we don't know that at the time, but, um, learning that story later, it's always, I love seeing those families that, that are all do that. And, and Danny was probably the least, uh, obviously the least known of the group, but yet he's standing pretty tall this morning. Yeah. He, you know, uh, Bob Hurley senior is considered to be one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time he won his games at the high school level he was a phenomenal high school basketball coach he's he when you talk about the great high school basketball coaches you talk about morgan wooten at at dematha and you talk about bob hurley at saint anthony's in jersey city and and you you, you don't go much farther than that uh, those guys were titans and bob hurley senior had two sons Bobby, who became one of the greatest college basketball players in history and won two national championships. And Dan, who had to grow up kind of in the shadow of that. And, and that was a challenge for him. Uh, as I said in the article, he had a demanding coach for a father and then demanding father for a coach. And it was hard on him. If he had Bob's ta Bobby's talent, it might have been different. But he was just a very good he was a, he was an extraordinary high school player, but when he got to college and played at Seton Hall, he was not an extraordinary college player, and that was hard on him when you had a brother. And if there had been time, maybe between Bobby uh, and 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 Dan, a, a, a space of five or six or ten years, as there is in some families, uh, there might it might have been a little bit less draining on on Dan and. Um, but uh, there wasn't. There were only a, a year or two. And so it was hard on him. And he had a rough time in a lot of ways at Seton Hall. And uh, then he got started coaching. And uh, he, he's had a very successful coaching career in a lot of ways. It is unconventional in some ways as well. He began as a, as a Division One assistant, worked at Rutgers, uh, did a nice job there. But the uh, staff got let go. He went into uh, uh, prep school, high school coaching, whatever you want to call it at St. Benedict's in New Jersey, coached a lot of elite players, and then went back into Division I coaching when he took over Wagner a little more than a decade ago and went from Wagner where he, he and his brother Bob uh, did very well and, and, and got into the NCAA tournament and then went from there to Rhode Island and he got them to the tournament, uh, ended Trey Young's college career in 2018 and then lost in the second round I uh, believe, if I remember correctly, it was to Villanova. And then uh, when that year became the head coach at UConn and has gradually built them back up to what they were uh, back in the, uh, you know, back in the Jim Calhoun years and 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 the apron years of the Jim Calhoun years. Uh, and I, I think that you looked at that team last night and it was it it it, it was one to me, it was one of the best teams built for March. From the beginning, I had them in the championship game on my bracket. It's one of the few things that that was that felt really good at the time that turned out to be true. Uh, I didn't have them winning. I had them losing to Alabama, but I thought that they would make it. And and I thought that uh, that they they played maybe even 
above what I thought they were capable of. And I'll be honest with you, I think they played over of what they thought they were capable of. I don't think they realized how good they could be if everything went right and and if they did everything right. But over the course of six games in the NCAA tournament, they did not have a single one that was not decided by double figures. And out of the, what are we up to now, 37 or so, 36, 37 expanded NCAA tournaments, they're one of only four teams uh, to win every game by double digits. Uh, and to have you know, they, they have the fourth largest average margin uh, victory margin in that stretch. So it, it says a lot about how how consistently powerful they were in this tournament. Yes, and I mentioned that earlier. But in a tournament that was the craziest that we've ever seen in all tournaments, virtually every team, well, minus the four that or I don't know if it's the four or six, whatever. Uh, but minus those teams. Every team I've ever seen in every year has to have a little luck, has a close game. Uh, things just have to go their way. Uh, it just uh, always is that way. It's, it's just that's how the tournament is. Right. How about this UConn team, man? They were just solid all the way through. I was fortunate to see them play in New York, and they just – they were together. They have been together as a team, and you can tell they – play together they just don't make a lot of mistakes and they use what their assets are they don't they don't lose track of what makes them exceptional uh, they, they 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 run plays to get jordan hawkins shots and they run them they don't you know they don't abandon them at the first sign of of a challenge uh they they get the ball inside to adama sonogo uh they fed the post uh they allowed sonogo to work the offensive boards when, He's when, a beast, by the way. He is. He is really powerful. Absolutely. Oh, man. He was terrific again last night and was named most outstanding player. It's one, one the 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 sports writers got one right there. We were happy to see that uh, <laughs> that, uh, that 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 went worked out the way it did after David McCormick uh, kind of got the, a rough deal a year earlier for Kansas when he should have been most outstanding player at the Final Four. Uh, or, or like when Caitlin Clark scored 70 points in two games and somehow didn't win most outstanding player. I mean, you, yeah, you'd like to, her to have won in order to give her the trophy, but my goodness, she scored 70 points. Come on, people. What are we doing here? She was clearly the most outstanding player. I, I, I just, I don't, sometimes I don't know what, what's happening. Uh, I don't I know remember. I just say, I can't remember the girl's name from, uh, uh, yell at you but I, I, she was giving her answer to that by doing this when on the floor <laughs> to, that, that was meant that was meant for caitlin clark and and caitlin's because they talked a lot about her dis what they called her disrespect of other players her disrespect of the team they saw before and how her antics were and and i i she's an unbelievable player she kind of reminds me of larry bird a little bit and Larry Bird was the greatest trash talker in the history of the world. I didn't know that, but that's the difference. Yeah, but that's the that's the difference. We didn't know that. Yes, he he did it, and they all those guys do it without the rest of the world knowing it. She right. does, she seems to make sure she does it to where everybody sees it, and that is what I think is the difference between the two. Other than that, she she can pack up. She if she would just do it quietly and say. I'm going to put this three in your face. She would probably do it. Um, so I, that's the only difference. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't understand why uh, everybody made such a big deal um, about the fact that uh, – made such a big deal about the fact that she made that gesture to the to the player from South Carolina that they weren't guarding, that they were leaving open. I guess it was like a gesture like that, something like that, a dismissive was, gesture. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 you know, okay. So then the young woman from, uh, from South, from uh, South Carolina then made three, three, three second half, three pointers that nearly made, you know, won the game for, so why are we, why are me? It, it's as if that was a great, thing that she did by dismissing her, but then the young woman from South Carolina came back and stuck three threes. Why didn't anybody talk about that? Uh, I, I, I just, I, I, that one of the things that struck me after 
the way this went um, in, in the women's tournament was that they were treated in the same way that the men are treated every year. So maybe this is a great moment for women's basketball in, in, a, in a perverse way. And what I mean by that is that what you have is all these people who never watched the sport until March come in and tell those people who watch the sport every day from November to April how everything's, you know, how everything should run, how everything is, who's really great, you know, who's all, what's what really matters, all that stuff that happens to men's basketball every March by people who don't follow the sport happen to the women. So now they've gotten their taste of that. And I guess that's a good thing because 10 million people did watch and you want them to be. But it would be nice if those people would maybe uh, wait until they gain some expertise on the subject at hand before they decide to tell everybody how they should run it. I wonder if the Iowa South Carolina ratings will outshine either of the men's games. I don't think so. Uh, Just because I, of the sheer numbers of the men's the, audience. You, group, no, the, 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 I mean, they got, they got nearly 10 million for the Iowa uh, LSU game on Sunday afternoon for the championship game. They got the, the audience came out yesterday. It was nearly 10. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, uh, you can find it. I think there's a tweet, I think from awful announcing you that uh, you can find it that, um, that that was more than a lot of NBA finals games and, uh, a lot of other events, obviously not more than most NFL uh, big games, but uh, b- bigger than a lot of stuff. It, it was a, that was a, a breakthrough audience for women's basketball. Now, can they hold them? I hope they can. Uh, but Both it was them. a big moment. Yeah, the whole Final Four. I mean, I, I, Iowa and South Carolina. That was a gigantic game. I mean, that was can't miss television. I, I, I was definitely. I'm like, I'm not missing that game. Are you kidding me? That's going to be a great game, and I yeah. did. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I had a dinner uh, thing Friday night and we finished up in time for me to, to watch uh, most of the game. Uh, not, I don't think I saw the beginning. I thought probably saw the last three quarters and it was, it was a special event. It was really terrific. And the final was not as good because LSU was just so great. Uh, just p- making plays that they're certainly capable of. They were a great team, but also p- they played beyond even their standard one of those nights where they're just everything they shot went in. And I mean, their standard is not that, I mean, it it was very, like I said, they were a great team, but they don't, I mean, they don't shoot the numbers uh, that they shot that night. Uh, No, didn't they? Unbelievable. Didn't they have a player off the bench or someone that scored 21 points in the first half that is not normally one of their big time scores. Uh, She sank a bunch of threes and, and she sank that three at the buzzer that banked in. Yes. Uh, for the half. So there's that. Um, Bob Knight was released from the hospital. Uh, saw that. So a great news there. Uh, Coach Knight going home. And I know a lot of people were worried. They sent that message out to the players that he went in and to pray for his safe return to home. Oh, and he has done that. Uh, so, but I know you've been away and all that wrapped up. Did you get a chance to talk to Dusty May much? I did not actually. I did not get a chance to spend a lot of time around him. Uh, uh, some of the, some of the things I was working on uh, diverged from uh, his participation. Obviously, if uh, if they had made it to last night and they came very close, uh, I would have gotten a chance to see him on Sunday and and Monday. Uh, but uh, I, I, I you know, obviously was uh, extremely impressed by how they played, by the togetherness they showed, by the uh, inspiration, the the uh, vision, and the and the uh, the confidence they played with. Uh, not many teams were able to do to that San Diego State defense what they were able to do on Saturday. Uh, just uh, one more basket for for the Aztecs uh, than for the, uh, the Owls, but uh, the Florida Atlantic certainly played beautiful basketball. Uh, well, I'm more was more impressed with was was Dusty's coaching style. He does not overcoach. He stands on the sideline. He is as calm as can be. He he's watching what's going on. He just makes the right moves. Doesn't get excited, which that will carry over to your team and allow you to make better decisions in crunch time. Uh, I'm just amazed on how comfortable he's never been to the Final Four. 
it looked like this was it was his tenth trip. Yeah, you know, I, I I think that that's you know there are different ways to do it, uh, but I always think I, I always admire the coaches the most who can focus on their team more so than extraneous elements, including officiating. I think there are times when a coach feels compelled to fight for his team or fight for her team, depending on men's or women's. Um, but I, I do think that sometimes coaches get distracted from that. And and I don't think you'll ever see that from Dusty. Uh, I think that uh, he's so composed, so together. It was really an impressive run uh, for, for the Owls. Uh, you know, interestingly, a lot of people talked about, okay, well, he just won a national championship. Where is he going to be ne- this year? Where is he going to be next year? Uh, you know, who, what job is he going to take? And I think what they missed in all of that was if you get that check, you can cash it anytime you want. You earn that check, you can cash it at any point. Uh, Shaka Smart stayed at VCU for, I think, another four or five years uh, before he left for Texas. Uh, for a job that didn't work out, and now he's killing it at, yes. at Marquette because I just saw that one publication has him as a too early number one next year. Yes, uh, I believe that's uh, Jeff Goodman. I don't know if he published it on Field of 68 or Stadium but or both. Uh, but that's his number one preseason team. Not sure that I'm there actually, with that. Actually, it might be in the athletic too. Is there someone that had one? In uh, the athletic? They may have agreed with Jeff. I saw Jeff's uh, tweet because someone someone was chastising Jeff. One of my one of my friends from Lexington, Alan Cutler, was chastising Jeff for doing that and basically saying Mike DeCourcy wouldn't do that. And I'm like, yeah, I did it last week. <laughs> I, I, I'm already I'm already in the books. Uh, we had. Uh, we had your buddy Seth Davis. Uh, maybe Seth did too. Uh, I, yeah, but- Seth has Marquette number one, Purdue number two. But we'll talk more about that when we come back. We've got to take okay. a quick break. The great Mike DeCourcy is with us from the Sporting News and Big Ten Network. Back with more Indiana Sports Beat Radio right after this. We'll be right back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Whether it's step away real quick during the break. Cool. Oh my, that's uh that's some list he's got. You got two Big East teams in out of the first three. Miami is fourth, <clears throat> Florida Atlantic fifth. Uh, that doesn't even sound realistic. But see, now you're put pressure on Florida Atlantic. They won't. I mean, I don't know how much they're going to lose next year. Maybe, maybe that's maybe that's what he's basing it off of. Maybe they're they not, don't lose they a lot. I don't think they. Lose. I don't think they lose a lot. Let's see. And that's uh, going to be tough. Though. You know, every they, coach is going to be looking for them to jump into the transfer portal. They're going to be trying they to lose, to get those guys. They lose one guy to graduation. Uh, yep, <clears throat> I think that uh, I, I don't think they'll lose anybody else, man. A team that won 35 games. Is that the most? How many did did UConn win? They won 30 something, but I don't know how many. I can right. figure I haven't out. even gotten to UConn yet. He does not even have UConn in the top 10, 11. There you go. They're at 12. Oh, they, they lose Sonogo. UConn was 31 oh, and 8. Well, they're, yeah, they're, they're gonna, gonna, gonna lose they're gonna lose Sonogo. They lose everybody. Them. But the, oh, they, don't, they might not. I mean, you don't know, though. I mean, they, they're they going to lose Sonogo and Hawkins most likely, but they, they could have Klingon back. Uh, they could have Andre Jackson back. They, they they could have Tristan Newton back. They, they will have Alex Caravan back, without a doubt. So we'll see what, what happens. But I think he's assuming uh, that everybody will leave. Uh, and maybe he made that decision after last night. Obviously, like I said, I was – I was a week early, so I don't know. I don't know what all of them will do. Uh, you don't know who, what anyone will do, really, except the one. But I two. love this list. I got to tell you, you look up and you see Marquette, Purdue, Creighton, Miami, Florida Atlantic in the top five. That is, I that is just amazing to see that. I I think it's fun. Um, a lot of other people may not. I know a lot of people, most people want to see the Blue Bloods. Man, I think that that game last night would have been so much more fun if it, if it had been the FAU. But, of course, I wanted to see Dusty May in there. Um, <clears throat> Michigan State, back at six. 
<laughs> Where's Kentucky in their number one recruiting class? Uh, they're number three. No, they're further down, I guess. Where I saw, I knew I saw them a minute ago. UCLA seven, of course. What and look, what a job Mick Cronin has done. Just yeah. return them back to every year. Arizona eight, Kentucky nine, Duke ten. Right, here we go, guys. In and pick up at BB's Market with no extra charge. So leave the heavy lifting to us and enjoy healthy eating with stocked meals in your fridge. Order online today at thefreshfork.com. Fresh Fork is a proud partner of Wow Network. This segment is brought to you by Remax Advanced Realty, Indie Home Pros team by Cheryl Sizemore. Now back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Tuesday, April 4th. Hope you're having a great day. We are because Mike DeCourcy is with us from the Sporting News. Brought to you by Remax Realty. If you're in the market for a home in Indiana, Indianapolis area, you need Cheryl Sizemore and her two decades of experience. It could be the difference between you getting the home you want or not. Reach out to her. Cheryl at IndyHomePros.com. Mike, I'm looking at, uh, just because it's fun to talk about, but uh, in the in the athletic, they're way, Seth Davis is way too early, top 25, which I have learned, if I've ever, ever learned anything this year, I know one thing. This list doesn't mean jack squat. Uh, and it has nothing to do with Seth Davis or anybody else. We don't know crap about what team is going to be good. We don't know who's going to be on what team. We don't know how well they're going to play. It College basketball is becoming one of the most hardest things to predict because of all the change. Uh, it's crazy. It is hard. Uh, I don't think UConn was in anyone's preseason top 25. Uh, because, FAU certainly wasn't. <laughs> well, I, yeah, but, I mean, FAU is a different deal. Uh, well, I know. I get it. I get it. Right. I mean, but UConn is not hiding. You know, they're not hiding. They're, they're in plain sight. They're, right. They were in the NCAA tournament last year as a, four, as a five seed. So that puts them as one of the top 20 teams in the country last year. Uh, but they did not seem to have an answer at point guard. That turned out to be Tristan Newton, the transfer from East Carolina. Uh, they did not seem to have the necessary three-point shooting, and all of a sudden uh, you bring in Alex Caravan to compliment Jordan Hawkins, and, uh, and, and they start to get a little bit of, uh, of stretch to the court. They get a little bit of, of room, and then that makes Sonogo. Uh, better. Sonogo became a better player by getting himself into even better shape. Uh, th th those guys that commit themselves to, to making their bodies better uh, often get great rewards. And in his case, uh, he became a more dynamic defender, a more difficult player uh, for opponents to defend uh, when he got the ball. And he worked on his three point shooting. And who, you know, he only made like uh, 17 in the year. But he made two that essentially changed the game on Saturday in their semifinal against Miami. So all that stuff is hard to anticipate. Who's going to work and who's not? Not everybody does. Not everybody goes away from this and said and says, I've got this great opportunity to, to win a championship with my team or pursue a Final Four or whatever, and then that's going to help me become a pro. Some people go away and say, I'm a pro. I'm ready to go. And then they don't do anything. And then you know what happens? They're not pros. Uh, that's That happens all the time. And some guys aren't even pros, and but they have a great year and they rest on it and think, I'm going to enjoy the heck out of this. You know, I just had a breakthrough year and I'm, I'm going to enjoy every second of this. And while everybody else is working their tails off in July, I'm going to be enjoying the heck out of this. And then they aren't any good the next year. Uh, or they're a disappointment and everybody gets on their case and everybody wonders why they're not better. And so what happens, you know, it's not even necessarily just what the, the obvious stuff like, OK, who gets recruited, uh, who goes to the draft, uh, who 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 uh, who transfers where, you know, who decides that they need a new uh, fresh spot. I mean, I saw I believe it was Tremont Mark that left Houston. 
uh, in the portal. I'm like, wait, what? You know, I mean, you played you, you played in the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight. You're a you know you're a featured player, and you think there's something better out there for you than that, than than being coached by Kelvin Sampson and playing in uh, in this you know this circumstance. I, what what are you looking for? Uh, I you know I, I don't some of the some of the transfer decisions that you make you don't even necessarily see coming. Uh, you're, you're talking about a guy who averaged 10 points a game, shot 39 percent from the field, was basically his team's second perimeter option on a team that had a, uh, a, a a not a consensus first team All American, but a first team All American in Marcus Sasser. Uh, he I think he made the NABC's team. I, I don't. I, you can't even predict some of this stuff. Uh, so. It, it really is a challenge, but over and above all of that, you don't know who's going to work. It's usually the majority, but one or two, ten, whatever, that don't, that's a difference-making deal for that team, and then that team isn't as good, and, and it all kind of has a chain reaction. So it really is a challenge to do those things, but um, I will let you in on the secret. I don't know that it's a secret. Why does Seth, Jeff, uh the, the ESPN, us, why do we all do it? People like it. It's, exactly. you know, we do the best we can with it. We acknowledge uh, in, in the very, uh, I don't know who coined the phrase way too early. I might have been the one, I'm not sure. But uh, in, in our way too early top 25s, we acknowledge that it is a speculative exercise, but people do read those articles and do, do cite them and talk about them. And in part, you know, I, I'm not going to make stuff up, but I am going to uh, going to give the readership uh, an article that they look forward to reading. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree because somebody has to be in those slots. Uh, there, there has to be. If you ask someone, well, what do you think? Okay, well, there has to be someone there because it's going to the, the season's going to be played next year. Um, Hunter Dickinson kind of fits into that list of not of surprise entrance into the portal. Uh, he was one that not, I don't know if anyone expected that, uh, but man, what a, what a, what a get that's going to be for someone. Yeah. What the buzz seems to be that Maryland is the leading candidate uh, to wind up with that. Wow. I, I, I'd heard yesterday that they hired his high school coach uh, to a staff position there. And that that may have a, uh, an impact on where he goes. I don't know that for certain. It's obviously speculative, but that's the buzz right now. Uh, Hunter Dickinson is a terrific player. I think he got frustrated by the fact that uh, they weren't able to build on their success. Uh, I, I, I this is again just uh, educated guessing. I think he probably was frustrated by their inability to build on the success of his freshman year. I mean, he built on it and. Uh, and they did have some success as a team, and they made the Sweet 16 a year ago. Uh, but the the absence of of outstanding point guard play, I think he felt that was holding him back a little bit. Uh, he'll play if Maryland is the answer. He'll play with Jameer Young next year, uh, and if they those two work really hard on ball screen offense, they could be really hard to stop. Uh, that could change Maryland completely because they had nothing like that this year. They were just all, all shooting and no big, no big really. They had no, yeah. no, no true presence inside. Uh, and they've got a great recruiting class coming in too. Yeah. Uh, Julian Reese, I thought was a really good effective player, but he uh, was very, you know, very lean for the position, it, especially in the big 10 when you're playing against guys like Hunter and like, Zach Eady and like Trace, uh, he he could move on offense and be hard for them to catch, but uh, it, it was hard for him physically to hold his ground in the low post against guys like those three I mentioned. Uh, th if you get Hunter in there, I think Julian can become a rim running type presence, uh, and and he can continue to develop his his away from the basket game. Uh, and and again, because Hunter can play away from the bucket. Uh, when he did that for Michigan, it was really problematic for them uh, because they didn't have anything on the inside to chase a rebound or to be an option in the post. And now you would have that with Hunter playing pick and pop. You could keep Julian Reese near the rim, uh, presuming Julian stays. 
Uh, and then, and then you'd have a really terrific tandem between the two of them. So uh, obviously we don't know for certain that's where it's going, but that does seem to be the early buzz. And, and again, that goes back to what I said about the difference, that one difference that could, that could take Maryland who was a, uh, you know, they won the, most of their games at home. Uh, they made it into the tournament, but they were just not that good this is a complete this changes that team uh, and like i said i know they've got some great recruits coming because they've won some great recruiting battles uh so they're building something over there and but i think he's building a little bit more of a rick bettino esque uh style a little faster pace than the big 10 is normally seeing i, I don't know that but of course he's over on the east coast he, he was under uh rick for a while so do you see that or the big 10 has to change you know jim don't buy into that L last night the national championship was won by the team that had adama sanogo and donovan Klingon. now donovan Klingon is not slow he's going to play in the nba he's going to be a first round pick because for a 7-2 guy he can really move for a 7-2 guy he doesn't move like uh like he's carl lewis um the, the, the idea that the Big Ten plays wrong and that's why they don't win is a canard. It's it's not true. Uh, the last two championships have been won. The la and I'm just thinking of the last two. Last year, David McCormick uh, was a low post, I you know, totally rooted to the post big man. Now he could go up the line a little bit and that sort of thing, but he wasn't. You know, he wasn't. If he had, if he had an NBA game you know, playing on the perimeter, guarding ball screens and all that, he'd be in the NBA. Uh, that's, you know, he was a very good college low post center. He was never a great one, all, except in the in the final four, he was a great one. But for the most part, he played four years at Kansas and was never a great player, but they won because they had him. They played against, in that game, Armando Baycott, another guy who, again, he can move, a, a, a fair amount, but he, again, if he had an NBA game, he'd be in the NBA now. He's coming back for another year of college basketball. Uh, you and, and so that's who played for it last year. Last night, uh, you had uh, in in San Diego State a team that played a a six eleven center who could move, uh, but didn't have necessarily a low post game. And on the opposite side, you had Adama Sanogo, who was a tank who can move a little and who probably will be a second round pick in the NBA draft. Now he's not an elite uh, mover, uh, but he, 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 maybe somebody takes him late first, but, uh, but he, he doesn't, he doesn't have that. Uh, and then Donovan Klingon, who's seven foot two, uh, he moves, he moves great for a seven, two guy. Uh, and that's going to make him a pro, but not, none of this is all that different from like, do you, do we think Indiana lost because, they played trace and they threw the ball to him in the post. No, they lost because they didn't have enough shooters. And the one that they had, they didn't give the ball that, that in the end, that's why they didn't win as many games as they might have. It, 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 the problem isn't the way the big 10 plays. The problem is that they need more good players. If Indiana had had just, let's give them, let's give Indiana Jordan Hawkins and Andre Jackson uh, and, and Naheem Haleen uh, around Trace Jackson Davis and Race Thompson. How much better are they? Uh, it, it changes their team. I mean, they had one great perimeter player to go with one great post player and one, you know, big time soldier and a three point elite three point shooter. They didn't give the ball. That's why they didn't win. It wasn't because they threw the ball into the post. UConn just won it. That's two in a row that won it throwing the ball into the post. They, it's not all they did, but it's but it was the core of why they won. So I'm not buying for a second this idea that the Big Ten plays the game wrong and that's why they're not winning. The Big Ten is not winning in March because they need more terrific players. They're winning games in the regular season because they're extraordinarily well coached. They follow game plan. They follow scouting report. Uh, they have very good players but they need more, more really good ones. They're going to be two first round picks off of that UConn team at least. And like I said, Sonogo could maybe sneak in. There aren't any teams in the big 10 that have that. And the one that came closest uh, 
with Michigan didn't have the point guard play they expected to have because the ex point guard they expected to have. Now, I don't know whether he would have been a NCAA tournament slash Final Four slash national champion level point guard, uh, but uh, he he was hurt for and lost for the year, and they, Doug McDaniel had to step up, and he wasn't ready. He, he had he had a really good freshman year for somebody who was forced into the breach, so to speak, uh, but he wasn't ready to to lead a team at that level. And, and I'll tell you the other thing that people miss is one of the things that hurts teams slash leagues the most, especially now that we have name, image, and likeness, is when players leave prematurely. Not early, not early entry. Everybody has that. Jordan Hawkins is going to leave, and he's going to be a top 15 pick, and good for him. That's what you're supposed to do. Come in, win, go pro, and, and get hit in the lottery. That's the way it's supposed to go. It's not supposed to be come in, win a first-round game, go pro, and then be picked in the second round. Nobody was damaged more by that phenomenon last season than the Big Ten. Uh, you had Michigan lose two, Caleb Houston, Musa Diabate. What would Michigan have been with those two players this year if they had, if they had stayed and worked to try to become first-round picks? You know, what would Michigan State have been over and above a Sweet 16 team if Max Christie had remained to become an All-America candidate and first option instead of them always scrounging for baskets uh, with every trip down the floor? What would they have been? It's second round pick. The, the, the biggest problem in college basketball now or the concern is guys who do that now it's a it's a it's a it's a huge massive mistake in the name image and likeness era where you can basically make second round money as a collegian if not better than that depending on your profile to go and become a second round pick if you have first round talent and all three of those guys that i mentioned that left to become second round picks were first round talents in 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 Houston's case he was a lottery talent if he comes back and he makes shots. In Christie's case, lottery talent, if he comes back and he makes shots. Is there any guarantee you're going to make shots? No. But do you think that they're going to look at you if you're Max Christie after a second year and say, oh, we were going to take you 33rd, now we'll, we won't take you? No, they'll still take you uh, if you come back and you don't make shots. But if you do, then they're taking you 20 or 15. Uh, that, that, was, that was the biggest thing that affected – the Big Ten last year, this past season, was those guys going pro uh, b before their time. They sp they spent, you know, it's like you buy a stock. I'll give you a great example of this. In the mid-2000s, maybe 2006, 2007, um, I bought Chipotle stock uh, it, because I love their restaurants and they were starting to grow. Hey, did we get three, three burritos? No, I don't. I don't own it anymore, so I'm not. A, I'm not Damn a part it. owner. But I bought. Oh, I bought like a, I don't know, maybe 200 shares or whatever it was, uh, and because it was starting to grow, and I remember I was uh, in Pittsburgh, and they were so excited to get their first Chipotle, and I thought there might be something to this, and I, I bought it around 45, and I sold it around 56 or something like that. Okay, so I made a little money, and then it went to 250, and it got you know, I mean, so. So I sold my stock too early. Well, so did Max Christie, and that impacted Michigan State, and that impacted the Big Ten. Well, uh, then you look at, but you can look at the other side of the coin. Is UConn just won their fifth national championship in twenty four years? It's been twenty three years since the Big Ten has won a national championship. Um, Purdue, the most successful team of all time in the conference, uh, with. 24 conference titles, whatever it is they have now, but virtually no NCAA success. Haven't been to a Final Four since Moby Dick was a minnow, 1980, uh, and they've only been to two of those. Uh, so it, it's it, I, it, you just look at that, and they're just not having success in the NCAA term. I mean, I'm not saying zero, but the, the kind of success that that the 
that we saw in the in the nineties, that uh, in the seventies, in the eighties, um, and, and it's gone away. Now basketball has changed. Other teams have gotten better. Other schools have gotten better, and that's a big part of it. But the Big Ten seems like it's just getting kind of left behind on the national level. How can you be left behind when you've had more bids in the NCAA tournament than any other league in the last? Three you years? get in, but you're not winning. I meant I don't mean left behind by the they're being ignored. They're they're not they're falling behind in success of of the, all, all these other conferences and programs because they're not matching it. Well, I, I think they have had three. I think they they had one really. I, I hate to use the word disastrous, but it was pretty close to that in 2021. Um, that that's not an. I don't think that's an. When you lose oh, a, yeah. you lost a one on on day two or uh, round two and a two and a three on day one of the tournament. I mean that's pretty close. Uh, last year was a disappointment for sure, but it wasn't. I mean you you got Purdue to this to the Sweet 16. Uh, they didn't have as many high seeds of last year, uh, but they didn't play to the level that they're capable of. But then this year, to be honest with you, other than Purdue's one versus 16 implosion, the Big Ten played fine. I mean, they, they had, they had uh, six teams out of their eight that were seeded to lose in the first weekend. They were supposed to get two to the, to the Sweet 16. They got one. Now, not the two that were seeded to that, but they got – they got one. They were supposed to get two. If you take Purdue out of it, just about everybody performed above or at expectation. Just about everybody. Um, you had Northwestern get in, win a game a, 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 in a 7-10 game, and then play UCLA's tail off. You had Penn State get in as a 10, upset the number seven seed, get in and play against Texas and play Texas's tail off. Uh, nobody other than that Purdue game and then maybe Illinois, which, you know, we knew that Illinois team was broken anyway. Uh, so they got in, they did what we expected them to do, which was be marginally competitive in an eight, nine game and then go home. That's who they were. It was, they didn't surprise anybody. I don't think this was that bad a year for the big 10 in the NCAA tournament, other than losing a one in round one, which is a significant thing. I am not diminishing it. But what the Big Ten has been over the last several years is extraordinarily deep. We don't know what would have happened in 2020, but I don't suspect that would have materially changed this conversation because it was kind of the same then. We, we don't think that there, was, there were many great teams, but there are a lot of really good ones. And I, I, people don't want to hear this. They think it's an excuse why do people buy into data when it says this, that, and the other thing? But when it says that teams that come out of leagues that are extraordinarily deep and that get a lot of tournament bids don't do well, why do they all of a sudden say, oh, that's just an excuse? But the data says it's not just the Big Ten. It was the Big 12 this year. The Big 12 underperformed. They had 70% of their membership in the, in the, in the NCAA tournament and they underperformed historically deep ACCs don't perform well. I think before this year, the winning percentage of, of teams that have gotten eight or more teams into the tournament leagues that have gotten eight or more in the winning percentage was somewhere around 55% or something like that. It's not great. I mean, that, that you should be doing better than that. And that's with championship runs by UConn in 2011 and Carolina in 2017. So those teams went 6-0. They gave you 12-0 head start, and you're still only a little bit above 500. And, and we saw SEC this year did not perform well in this tournament. Uh, the, their number one seed, Alabama, Sweet 16, out. Uh, it's hard to come out of a league like that where you're banging your head into the wall for two solid months. You probably played a reasonably difficult non-conference schedule. Other, you know, I, I, yeah, last night Dan Hurley was, you know, was saying that we were in the best league in the country. No, you weren't. You were the best team and you're the champion, but you got to play DePaul. You got to play Butler. Those were not good teams. Uh, there, there was one or 
Four good teams in there, probably. Four really it's good five, teams. Five, yeah, five, Creighton, five really Xavier, good teams. Creighton, Xavier, UConn, um, Providence, uh, one other. Oh, uh, Providence, so I didn't think of Providence. You know, they, had, they had five really good teams, and then, and then a couple that weren't very good, and then a couple of bad ones. And that's that's a great position to be in for if you're if you're one of the better teams because you get those nights where you can kind of play okay and still win. You don't want to have to be your best every night because if you keep spending your best just to survive your league, you get into March and you've spent all your best. That's the truth. And the data the data is the data. And I, it's not my opinion. It's what the facts say. And, I, and, and when I update those numbers after this, after especially you look at the Big Ten and the SEC, they're not going to be any more impressive because it's just hard to do it that way. And it, they, the, I, you know, I, people talk about – I was having this conversation on Twitter the other day about the 2011 Big East when they had 11 teams that got into the field and wasn't that the best conference of all time. And I said, oh, it was for the teams at the top. Because they had four teams in the league out of 16. They had 16 teams. They had four teams in the league that did not beat anyone but each other. Couldn't beat anyone. They did not even pull an upset. They, they played each other. You know, Rutgers, I think it was Rutgers, Providence, Seton Hall, uh, and South Florida. Uh, they could not beat anyone but each other in that circumstance. And so you, you played them. Man, you know, you you could you could sleep in and and not go through shoot around and still win the game, but in the Big Ten, who could you do that against? Minnesota, on the road? I don't think so. Home, maybe. But they had Jamison Battle. Everybody's climbing to get after Jamison Battle now. He's in the portal. Everybody wants him. They weren't that bad. They were bad, but they weren't that bad. Uh, I just people don't understand how. The dynamics of that work and how hard it is on a college player and a college team to have to be their best every night just to survive the, that night and move on to the next day and not get buried by, okay, let's just, let's, uh, what if we took tonight off and took our, our, our loss and just, you know, okay, we're going to, we're going to do it that way. And we're just going to take that loss. Okay. Well, next night you got to play, go play Michigan on the road. Well, heck, if we do that, that could be a two game losing streak. And then the next one after that is Indiana at home. Oh, I'm now we're on a three game. You can't. It's really hard. So people who rag on the Big Ten, Jim, they do it for one reason because they want to rag on the Big Ten. They want to criticize the conference because they don't like it's. They don't like the fact that it is successful, rich. It comes with the territory. <laughs> yes. Last question uh, of Indiana. I'm, I'm expecting Xavier Johnson to be back. Uh, Trey Galloway, Malik, uh, Renew, Caleb Banks, CJ Gunn. Two freshmen coming in. They've got Peyton Sparks who comes in from Ball State, a, a massive rebounder, and they still have three spots to fill. Uh, obviously, they have got to get a couple of sh knockdown shooters with that uh, uh, beyond anything else but what with three spots what would what would that third spot do, do, do you think they need yet one more big guy uh to go along with Malik uh, Renew and Peyton Sparks uh do you need one more uh Hunter Dickinson's a different type of big guy uh something like that he would be completely different but uh what what is the the last spot that they need to fill obviously the two shooters well, I, yeah, I think you need shooting, and I also think you need chemistry. I think you need to make sure that the players that you bring in are going to fit into into IU. Uh, I think that's a that's a big concern. Is don't just recruit the player's name, the player's uh, history. Uh, recruit the player. Uh, Tristan Newton. I met his dad last night. Really good guy. Uh, really really pleasant. Um, that, that's a guy, Tristan Newton averaged 17 and five last year at East Carolina on a 500 team, not, not 500 conference. They were well under 500 in conference overall 500 team. Uh, and, 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 but had super hungry, you know, really wanted to be successful and it wasn't a smooth ride for him, but really wanted to be successful and, and fit their culture and fit the profile of the team had a great winning personality and was able to, 
you know, become a championship point guard. I mentioned to him, I said, you know, for all the heck you've taken this year, whether you were good enough, you're now in the same sentence with Isaiah Thomas and Magic Johnson. You're a you're a national championship winning point guard. And he's like, oh, my God, I hadn't thought of that. Now I have. Uh, it's you know, it's it was pretty cool to see that. Uh, what he was able to do, but he did it because he was hungry. He he didn't believe he was God's gift to hoops. Uh, he believed that uh, UConn was a place where he could become great. Uh, he could become a part of something special, extraordinary, and he was. And and I think that's something that IU has to measure as they go into the portal uh, and try to bring somebody out. They have to make sure they get the right chemistry, the right fit. Like, uh, what's up next for you, brother? Oh, I hope some rest, Jim. I really do. <laughs> yeah. My buddy A John Rothstein always says, we sleep in May. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm sleeping in April. You can sleep in May. <laughs> yeah, I, much deserved. Uh, I'm sure the next thing in your future is a flight out of Houston. Yes. Uh, uh, I'll leave uh, for Houston a little bit later in the day. I will be, I promise you, Jim, I will wake up next Tuesday morning in time to visit with you. You know, we should, I, I should get to the airport and make sure that when you arrive, uh, you're fetid with a little red carpet and throw some rose petals at you. I would just like arrival. it one time. I think it would be really cool to come in and like have somebody, you know, stand there with my name on a card. That would be cool. Right. Man, what, what time's your flight in? <laughs> <laughs> That would be pretty cool. And then they, they got the sign. They take your bags. Yes. You just walk away. Yeah, I've never had that either. <laughs> <laughs> Mike DeCourcy, the great from the Sporting News and Big Ten Network. Thank you, brother, so much. Appreciate Thanks, you. Man. Get some rest. Take care. We're back with more Indiana Sports Beat Radio after this, including Karate Kuzier right after this. We'll be right back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. If you're in the market. Welcome, Chronic. What's going on, John? I'm doing well. Doing well. CH, what's up? What up, Jim? Oh, you know what, man? I've been trying to get by there for freaking three weeks. I've got a couple of cards to give you and Rish. I am uh, alternate schedule here this week. My, my cohort is heading down to Texas, so I got today off. Oh, wow. So I just got done meeting with an excavator and got a uh, got a pork butt on the smoker. Oh man, sounds good. So you're off today. Are you back tomorrow? Or are you off this week? I'll be back tomorrow, and then uh, next Thursday I'm tagging along with my wife. She's uh, been invited by Coca Cola to go down to Hilton Head for the golf tournament down there. Why? Why would you want to do that? That just doesn't sound like any fun at all. You know, that's what I was thinking. We used to, uh, <laughs> we used to do Vegas on the reg. Uh, oh, she's just, she, she doesn't get to travel a whole lot anymore, mainly because she's too busy putting fires out here on the various campuses. So we Where figured. We'll do? Be, um, she is works for IU. Yeah, yeah. She's the associate vice president in charge of business partnerships. So she uh she cashes checks for IU. Is that for the the school side or the athletic side? Uh, university wide. So athletics has Learfield that does all their um, right their, their glad handing, but she does um, corporate relations, business partnerships, sponsorships, licensing, and trademarks. Pretty much everything on but research, but she's got her toes pretty deep in the research pool as well. But there's a separate office that handles that. I was on the IU site the other day looking for somebody, someone specific. 
And I started going through all those names and I'm like, good God almighty. Look at all these names. It was just like, it was a gigantic corporation. Yeah. Oh no, it's massive. It's massive. Uh, it, is, it is crazy. Her right, office go, brings guys. in about 120 million a year. Your selections. Feast also provides a wide variety of cheeses, gourmet sandwiches, entrees, a coffee bar, bread, pastries, all made fresh and mouthwater. Stop by Feast Market and Cellar today. This segment is brought to you by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Now back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coy, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Tuesday, April 4th. Jim Coyle with you. Joined by Chronic Hoosier. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Uh, in addition to having a, a pork butt on the smoker, I just stopped for a second and realized uh, we're back to being undefeated again right now. Everybody is. It's a, it's a new day. Uh, the new season starts now, honestly. Uh, off season is uh, is here. And, you know, at least on the uh, the IU basketball side, uh, not exactly sure what that's going to look like yet, but uh, we've had a little bit of movement since we last spoke and probably likely to see some more here in the coming days. So exciting times in B-Town, man. Yeah, Chris Ledlam uh, has a, a visit I scheduled, I believe, uh, the, the, the guy from Harvard. Um, and you heard Mike DeCourcy on right before, and he said something that is – the most important of all they these guys have to have chemistry they have to play together to win i i saw that with the miami team you saw that with the yukon team the fau team uh san diego state you, these teams that went far you, every one of those teams had transfers on it but man oh man they look like they've been playing to, miami looked like they've been playing together for two years yeah, you know, I, I think Mike was uh, was spot on with that. And I've been saying it, you know, forever. Um, you know, there's a reason that John Calipari doesn't win a title every year. Uh, doesn't get to the Final Four every year. You mean despite, besides you can't coach? Well, you know, in, in spite of having, um, you know, some of the top talent in the country year after year after year after year, uh, it, it generally is going to come down to chemistry. Um, it, it's everything in college basketball, especially single and elimination tournament play. And uh, it's just extraordinarily difficult to get the mix right when you're constantly having to replace so many pieces. And, you know, as we discussed last week and previously, um, you know, there, there has been no greater time in the history of college basketball to do what I use trying to do this year uh, in as much as replacing, you know, so many key players uh, on the roster than in, in the portal era that we now find ourselves in. Um, but at the same time, you know, the peril that exists is exactly what I was referencing with Calipari. You're seeing it now with Duke and a lot of the other blue bloods that are just consistently raking in five stars uh, and top recruits is it's really tough to get the chemistry right. And when you're, when you're mixing in so many new ingredients so frequently, uh, there's just so much uh, that can go wrong, so little margin for error there and getting it right. Um, not, not the least of which is, you know, you're bringing in a bunch of young guys and, and competing against, uh, you know, quite honestly, some grown men. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be one of those things that you really have to, uh, you've got to have a touch. You've got to have your finger on the pulse of your locker room, of your, your program's culture and find not just the best athletes or basketball players, but the best fits, uh, for your program and the roles that you're going to ask those guys to step into uh, or else you're going to continue to struggle with this. But a uh, ton of opportunity, ton of risk, uh, and you know, tons of questions yet to be answered as far as what it's going to look like, but certainly no shortage of challenges uh, for Mike Woodson and his staff in trying to construct the roster for next season. Yeah, because that's still the thing. I, another thing that I asked Mike about, we, we know what they have minus three. Um, having just brought in Peyton Sparks from Ball State, and uh, how do you feel about poaching from uh, cannibalizing your own, uh, taken from Michael Lewis? <laughs> hey, that's that's the pecking order of things, man. Uh, uh it's it kill or kill or kill or be killed. Um, you know, I'm glad he left first 
but it it I, it sucks when you lose a player like that. No matter what, if you're Michael, uh, it just sucks. And then to have him go to Indiana, uh, I don't know if that matters anymore or not. Um, I, I mean, maybe you feel better about it because that's your school. That's where it may, you're, if you're happy for him, I don't know. Michael's too damn competitive. I doubt it. He, he wants to win. I'll tell you what, I can't remember where I saw it. I'm have to look it up here real quick. Um, somebody attributed a quote to Mike Lewis last week, basically um, saying something to the effect that he, uh, you know, he talked to him about um, what it meant uh, to come to IU, that he was joining a brotherhood, uh, acknowledging that, you know, this was, uh, this was his, his childhood team. This is who he grew up rooting for. So it, it, it would be really difficult for anybody uh not to mention an Indiana born and bred guy who uh, is an Indiana alum, uh, you know, who got to play in the national title game uh, to see one of your players have that opportunity and deny him. Uh, I just thought it was extraordinarily classy of, of Mike Lewis to give those words of encouragement uh, in spite of the fact that, you know, he's getting his roster cherry picked here, but uh, you know, kudos to him for taking it well. And, and, and kudos to, uh, to sparks for being able to actualize one of those dreams. And for a lot of guys, you know, uh, those opportunities are going to be there now. And it's not unlike the general student body. You know, I know a lot of folks who uh, didn't get into IU Bloomington uh, as their their first choice when they were coming out of high school. And, you know, whether they go to uh, one of the satellite campuses or somewhere else that are able to uh, to come over after a year or two, once there's some openings in the, uh, in the enrollment system. Um, you know, kudos to those folks that are able to make that dream happen because Lord knows, uh, I was fortunate enough to get to do it, uh, as well as my brother and my, just like my father did and an experience that changed all of our lives for the better. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. So, um, you know, that's the thing though, is you've got to find guys who want to be here that are that live in their dream, not just, you know, um, the, the mercenaries, if you will, who are chasing the NIL paychecks and, uh, and chasing that clout. Uh, which is certainly going to be part of it. You know, you get guys at this level, they have aspirations uh, well beyond NCAA basketball. And, you know, as, as a basketball program, it's their job to get them ready and, and prepared. And, you know, one thing Mike Wilson has in his bag this offseason that wasn't necessarily there last year, he's now going to be able to point to a couple of guys who were able to make that leap or able to improve themselves in their draft stock and uh, go on to play professional basketball in the NBA. Uh, as well as some other guys who are probably going to have some other uh, professional opportunities uh, abroad. So that's the, uh, that's the key component when you're trying to attract that caliber of talent is, is having demonstrable proof that you can get them where they're trying to go, that you can help facilitate those dreams. And you heard Jalen hood uh, in, in the wake of his announcement that he was uh, declaring for the draft, saying that, you know, the staff kept the word to him. They, they trusted him unequivocally. They believed in him. And uh, they they got him where he was trying to go when he chose Indiana to come play college basketball. So heck of an endorsement and hopefully, uh, you know, give a little bit of tailwind and some momentum to this staff as they try to uh, to reload for next season. Yeah, they uh, in talking about it, I, I know, let me first say, I'm not a coach uh, and I'm not a scout, but I can easily look and and see what Indiana needs to add to what they have. And that is shooting. We talked about that with Mike. They have got to have a couple of knockdown shooters. There's without question. And they have three spots to fill. You know, two of those have to be wing type players. I don't know what that third player is going to be. I don't think Caleb Love is what Indiana really needs. But again, that's not my decision. I don't know. You hear a lot about him, but I, I don't like to go by what you hear. But there is a lot of smoke out there with him. Indiana doesn't need smoke. Um, they don't need anything. They don't even need an ember. They need everything to be cold and and cool. Um, I'm just not sure that uh, Caleb Love is what this team needs from a position wise either. Well, you know, um, let me let me go back a step. Board I'm looking at, we've got four open scholarships now with Hood Shvino gone, uh, and and Sparks addition, um, with Cups and Newton coming in. You've got Renew Banks. Gunn, that's that's true. That's true. My bad. You're right. Class. You're right. Galloway, that's Sparks, great. and Leal are going to be the uh, the COVID juniors, uh, technically seniors by class, but eligibility wise, uh, 
still two years remaining after this. And assuming X gets back or gets his waiver, that's still four spots you got to fill. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in a perfect world, you probably distribute those fairly evenly across the uh, across the floor. It certainly wouldn't hurt to have another big uh, to back up or new. Although, you know, I, I expect Indiana to get a little bit further removed from that that post driven bully ball. Um, you can never have enough guards. Uh, and as you mentioned, you can ne- never have enough shooters. Uh, but you know, when you look at the tournament and, and the way a lot of these matchups shook out, uh, I would also argue that some athletic wings, guys that have multi tools in their yep. bag are going to be, uh, are going to be extraordinarily valuable going forward in the style of play that Woodson's indicated he's trying to move to kind of this positionless basketball, uh, there is a premium in this game for length, athleticism, and speed. Um, you know, and above all else, you got to be able to put the ball in the cylinder. So uh, it, it's going to be fascinating to see how they decide to to spread those openings out, uh, assuming that they're going to fill them all. Um, and you know, it it also raises the uh, the old issue that's been retired for a couple of years. Um, you know, the value of over signing classes, you know, scholarships are gold. You've got to manage them, uh, like they're your future. That's your nest egg. Uh, but you, you know, in this age, now you find yourself in a position where, uh, you know, it's April and, and you've got four openings on your roster, uh, for some critical spots that you've got to fill. So the portal certainly gives you a, a plethora of options there. Um, but it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword, as we mentioned with the chemistry. Uh, but there's no doubt Indiana has a lot of needs on its shopping list that it's looking to fill here. So it'll be interesting to see how the staff chooses to fill them and, and what that kind of points towards as far as what type of style of play we can expect to see from Indiana next year. Yeah, I I, I kind of mind uh, blown that, that extra. I don't know what I, I was thinking, who I was thinking that filled that. But uh, with that, Correction. Yeah, now no a guard, a big, and two wings. Um, and with the talent that is out there and the talent that Indiana has, Indiana could be a contender for the Big Ten title again next year. Because the one thing I told Mike this, and I'll say it a thousand times again, the one thing I've learned from last year is none of us know jack about who's going to be good, uh, because these teams are so different. Uh, and they, they gel together differently now because they're so different. So, uh, we don't know how good anyone in the big 10 is going to be. Purdue is listed, you know, as a not too early number two or three in the country, of course, because they're going to have the same roster back, but, and that's the same team that's beatable in the same way to me, but Indiana has an opportunity to completely reinvent itself. Uh, that's they're they're in a unique position where they're they and they are going to I think completely reinvent the identity on the court. I think they're going to have to uh, after you know the last two seasons with with uh, Woody having Trace at his disposal. Um, that was you know very clearly the way that Indiana was going to play it was almost exclusively through the post, um, and that was just a product of the uh, the ingredients that were left in the kitchen from the prior regime. So now we find ourselves in a, at a point where, you know, the majority of the roster, all but just a couple of players, um, you know, in as much as Galloway and Leal are really the only guys uh, left over from, from Archie Miller's staff that, that he brought in. So you're going to be looking for the first time at a roster that's almost exclusively uh, selected by this staff. So it's, it's their, their chance to put their mark on the program, not just with the players they're bringing in, but the style of play uh, and the culture. And that's one of those things that we saw, you know, over the course of the Tom Crean era, especially after 13, uh, just the perils of, of having to replace a lot of bodies, uh, but having to try to retain some semblance of your program's identity of the culture that you're trying to establish. And usually that's a product of leadership on the floor. And that's, that's certainly one of the, the big, big risks going forward uh, is you've got to find not only those, those positions, uh, those roster spots, but you've got to find guys that are going to be able to, to advance the, uh, the, the progress of, of this program building that the staff's undergoing right now, um, because there's just so many balls up in the air and so many pieces uh, moving around on the table. Uh, it can be real easy to miss the mark. 
And, uh, you know, you look at like the 17 Hoosiers. That was a team that had, you know, Thomas Bryant, uh, OG, Juwan Morgan, uh, you know, James Blackman, Robert Johnson. You had a ton of talent on that team, professional talent, NBA talent. And, you know, without the right mix, without the right leadership, you find yourselves giving away a home opportunity or an opportunity to host a, a home NIT game and and getting your doors blown off in Georgia Tech. So it's not always about talent. It's about having the right guys in the right spot uh, in the right combination. So uh, lots of risk, lots of reward going forward for Indiana as it enters the portal here. Yeah, I was just thinking that there are uh, – it's, it's almost – this next season will be almost just like a, a a fresh spring breeze of of new an infusion of fresh energy uh, because and and I'm not Trace Jackson Davis blaming him or any way but I'm just saying the Trace Jackson Davis era was such a shadow it was so big well now that's gone and this is it's a new era. Um, it, that's kind of the Archie era kind of going out. I know it's not completely gone with uh, a couple of guys left on the team, but for the most part, that was the Archie era kind of gone now. And you're going to have a lot of new faces that can bring in a lot of fresh energy. People like Peyton Sparks, who, who grew up, like you said, he, he dreamed to play at IE. Well, he's going to get that opportunity. So when you're allowed to, to live out your dream, I'm going to imagine you're going to be pretty happy. And as the energy I, I've already seen that he displays when he's playing on the floor, which is playing like a madman, I, I can only imagine what it's going to be like to see him when he's wearing an Indiana jersey doing that. No doubt. And that's, uh, you know, that's one of the things that, that Indiana fans have, have certainly embraced over the years. Um, and it, it's it's one of those things that, that gets really gray, you know, um, you probably don't have Trace Jackson Davis at Indiana, but for the fact that he grew up um, in Greenwood, you know, no differently than uh, uh, the Romeo is probably even a little thornier issue. Uh, but, you know, each one of those guys uh, who, who chose to put on the candy stripes, they make it that much easier for the next guy to commit to IU uh, who has similar dreams, who comes up from a, uh, you know, a similar upbringing, if you will. All that said, um, you know, I have zero problem right now with this staff going wherever the best talent may be. Uh, again, not just talent, but the best fit may be. And that's certainly something that Mike Woodson emphasized uh, early on. And I think he will probably continue to till he's done coaching here is the importance of these guys understanding what it means to play at Indiana. But make no mistake, uh, that's not something that's that's solely determined by what you know, what city is listed on your birth certificate. Um, you know, and I'd point to Gabe Cups as a prime example. I mean, he's one of those guys that I have a feeling is going to be the uh, the embodiment of a Hoosier, uh, no differently than Grace Berger was, uh, quite honestly. Somebody that just puts in the work, uh, that shares in their teammates' success, that helps facilitate other success and enjoys the accolades for themselves along the way. But uh, a great example of what it takes from a, you know, a, a roster building standpoint to get that mix right. And at the end of the day, you got to have guys that want to be here, uh, that want the best, not just for themselves, but for the university, uh, and most importantly for their teammates. And that's, that's quite honestly what leadership looks like. Um, you know, that sacrifice and you, you, you could do an entire case study on what Terry Morin has done on the, uh, the South end of cook hall to really establish and, 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 grow and, and let that flourish within her program. Uh, but that's certainly the challenge Mike Woodson is going to be tasked with going forward is finding those guys, because this is, this is going to be a bellwether year for Indiana, uh, at least in the Mike Woodson era. Uh, now that he has such a, uh, such an impact on what the program is going to look like going forward from a player standpoint, you got to get it right. Because as we've seen in years past, um, Indiana fans will give you a, uh, They'll give you some grace over the first couple of years, uh, but with each passing year and each, uh, you know, each season's tally that you're posting, uh, the hill gets a little bit steeper if you're not, you know, if you're not advancing, if you're not progressing. So there's a, uh, there's certainly an opportunity. There's a pitfall uh, if if you're not careful that you lose all the momentum of the last two seasons. And we said that last year, but you know, um, that was returning a ton of talent. Uh, returning a ton of players from the prior season. 
So now you get to start over again with uh, you know, almost half of your scholarships uh, being brand new to Indiana. So monumental task ahead, but monumental opportunities on the other side if they get it right. Absolutely. Uh, before I let you go, yesterday Tom Crean uh, was gracious enough to join us again, uh, as he has many times in the past. Great words for Terry. As a matter of fact, we were done with the show, and – he he wouldn't let me go. He said, "Oh, we can't we can't stop without talking about Terry Moore and what she's done." And so he went on for ten minutes to talk about Terry and 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 his biggest point was, I hope the administration there knows how important she is and yada yada. He had no idea that she's coming up in a contract year either, but he was really making a point of how important she is to this school and that he hopes that the administration uh, recognizes that. But uh, he had some really really get, great words for her. I'll tell you what, I was having a conversation with my uh, my best friend last night after that title game. How awesome is it to see a, a school that invests in its men program so that it can equal the success of its women's uh, team? So, <laughs> uh, you know, there's certainly a, a blueprint for IU to follow here going forward. But uh, part of that plan is absolutely paying Terry more and uh, locking her up, uh, you know, at this point. Uh, I don't know that IU does lifetime contracts. Uh, but you may have some of those Disney lawyers write the uh, the terms in there, and uh, and get you know get to that perpetuity uh, because what she's done, you know, uh, national coach of the year Terry Morin, uh, it just blows my doors off. Uh, still, it, it doesn't seem quite real. Um, you know, I, I, I watched that girl play high school ball. I watched her fill one of the largest high school gyms in the country. And to see her doing that now at Assembly Hall, um, I know a lot of folks are still really salty about the way the season ended. Um, and, you know, it's it stinks. It absolutely does. I, I can't think of a single year where Indiana has been eliminated from a tournament uh, where it didn't just sting and burn. Uh, and the better the team, the longer it lasts. Some you never get over. All that said, you know, it's kind of like the uh, – the, the, the people that want to bash trace because of the program uh, falling short under his, uh, you know, at least of the lofty expectations it set, um, you know, he had no choice in, in what era he was born in in uh, you know, what era he inherited when he stepped foot on campus. Uh, but I, I, I think it, it speaks volumes that he chose to be a part of it and that he left it in a better place than he found it. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. And uh, you look at the women's side that is just the identity. That is the core identity of this program right now is leaving it better than you found it. And, uh, you know, a lot of teams are re rebuilding Terry Moore and just consistently has been reloading and seemingly getting more dangerous each year. So some huge uh, shoes to fill with, with Grace Berger's departure. But I have no doubt uh, if there's a staff in the country that knows how to get its program's chemistry right, this staff has proven pretty adept at doing it. So excited to see what the future holds for them and uh, excited to see exactly uh, how strong of a, a contract Terry is able to negotiate with the leverage she's currently sitting on. Because uh, I, I will not soon forget the, uh, the sight of a completely full assembly hall to watch women's basketball. Uh, it's just it's everything that, that you would hope. For, uh, for Indiana basketball. So love to see that continue going forward. And uh, like I said, love to see the men uh, step their game up and equal what the women's success has done, just like uh, like UConn did last night. Cry Kuzier, appreciate you, brother. Look forward to uh, talking to you again next week. Thanks, as always, for having me. We'll catch you guys on the flip side. You betcha. Chronic Hoosier joining us here on Indiana Sports Beat Radio. We've got lots more coming up. Brought to you by Andy Moore Honda. Go to Andy Moore Honda.com to get more to your door. Back with that after this. We'll be right back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Weather. So we just do two quick 10 minute segments? They won't even be 10 minutes, they'll be really short. Yeah. It'll just be a couple minutes apiece. Probably five, around five minutes, I guess. Perfect. <clears throat> Perfecto. I mean, it's, I mean, it, 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 the timing oh, is I, fine, I, but also whoa, whoa, it's just, whoa, whoa, it's whoa, just whoa. stop, stop, stop. Can't do that. You cannot do that. Can't do what? Not here. Um, have those conversations. I didn't think I was saying anything wrong. Oh, 
I thought you were going to talk about the uh, the um, breaks. No, in in the context in which you're referring to, no. Okay, cool. <sighs> we'll give it to her, Andrew. Write that check, brother. Trust it's me. Funny how we use the term "lock lock them up." It's something that normally would be used as like a bad thing. Uh, yeah, well, is a good thing in coaching. But here's the thing, too. The minute I hear lifetime contract, nope, 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 no, that's, nope, that's nope. That's the nope. moment. That's when you give them a time to relax. That's what's. Let I me mean, look what happened to John Calipari with that. That's I mean, when that's, you screw yourself. They can't get out of that situation. They'd owe him like forty million dollars or what something. Be, what benefit? <clears throat> excuse me. What uh, benefit do you give out of getting anybody? It was the arrogance. Contract? It was arrogance. It was arrogance. What is he? I mean, really? What? What is he? Yeah, they went to some Final Fours back when when the one and done era was. But racing. he hasn't done anything since twenty what seventeen. Not only this, uh, let's see. Now, next year is judgment year for John Calipari. If if they don't, if they have another season similar to the last two or three, he may be gone. If if Kentucky can can uh, afford to pay him well, out, you can't afford to pay him out. That's the problem. It's it's like unbelievable amounts of millions of dollars, like forty million or something stupid. Yeah, but they they've got just like every other big big program, they've got boosters who would help out if they absolutely wanted to get rid of him. All right, here we go. With quality, local, and organic food as their main focus, Southern Stone strives to always provide their guests with an exceptional dining experience. With weekly specials, quick, attentive service, Southern Stone Restaurant provides delicious five-star comfort food with a Southern charm at two-star prices. Southern Stone Restaurant is part of Endeavor Hospitality's Wild Club. This segment is brought to you by Courtroom Sports Grill in Bedford. Now back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Tuesday, April 4th. Was this the day of the tornadoes? I'll uh, break back in 73, or was it April 3rd? Unfortunately, I remember that. I was a little kid. Uh, we were talking in the break about Kentucky and what, John, what were we talking about? We were talking about the lifetime contracts. Oh yeah. Yeah. The minute I hear lifetime, lifetime contract for anybody, I'm like, no, 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 no. You look exactly into the situation that Kentucky is in. They, they, they got all arrogant and chest puffed and wrote that lifetime contract to John Calipari. And now look, let's see what you got. Um, they'd like to see him go because do you know the, all right. He had what, does he have the number one recruiting class again next year? He does. He does. And I think that's oh, why, and I know that's going to be the, go so that'd be like the 10th or 11th, but that's going to be like the 10th or 11th time that he has had that. And I'll tell you right now, Kentucky has won one national championship in 24 years. So, I mean, for the talent that they have had, that, what does that say? Where'd you get the 24 years from? I mean, he's not, John Calipari hasn't been in the UK for 24 years. Kentucky has won one national championship in 24 years. In the what last you, 24 that, years. The last 24 oh, years, okay, they've won okay. one national title. I guess that makes more sense. But if you're referring to like the one and done era, which was ushered in by, by Mr. Calipari himself pretty much, you, you have to kind of lower that number, but I still get what you're saying. Um, yeah, when was that? That would have been... I don't know. That would have been. Well, he got hired. Was he hired at the same time as Tom Crean? 
Well, he was there when they won their last national championship, which was 2012. Well, I know that, but uh, was, was John Calipari hired the same year Tom Cream was hired at Indiana is what I'm trying to recall. I don't recall. It's a good question. Um, he might have been hired before? That's, they were really I, close. Know? The timelines are really close, obviously, but I think Kentucky fans – Here's here's what's always kept them grounded with uh, with with Calipari and why they keep crawling back. Well, it's kind of like in 2009, 2009. There so you go. So right around the well, I guess a year, year after. later, year yeah, after. year after. Um, they're always able to get over and cut their losses when they see who all they have coming in, and then it's like an abusive relationship. They get to this season, at least this is how it's been over the past few years, and these guys don't pan out to to what they're supposed to be. And well, this year they had the reigning national about. player of the year back. And yeah, and and that that may just be a just a little bit of complacency from Oscar Shibway. I mean, you've already won national player of the year. You're already making a couple of million dollars a year because of NIL. What more does Oscar Shibway really have to gain by by I guess like he's already had more money than he's ever imagined because of the situation that he came from what he's growing up with. He may not necessarily, I'm not trying to put words in, into his mouth, but he may not realize, or, or I, don't, I don't think realize is the right word, but he may not have the drive that he once had to be the best that he can actually be because he may feel like he's already made it, per se. Now, again, that's just speculation, but that's what, that's what all these major players in college basketball have to figure out nowadays. If, if what, they're, like, what, they're true, what their true goal is, is, is it to make the most in NIL? Or is it to win a national championship? Is it to go to the NBA? It's a, it's a, I don't want to call it a power struggle, but it's just the way, uh, the era that we're living in in college basketball. Howie pointing out uh, on the Andy Morhana hotline, as of three days ago, there are about 1,100 players already in the basketball transfer portal. Um, and there will be more, not a, I don't expect a ton more now, uh, because the season is over, coaches are have all the coaches that were that had lost or didn't make the tournament have already been scouring the transfer portal. Um, you want to get this done as quickly as possible. Sp uh, spring practice has started for uh, Indiana. These teams are practicing together. They need to get these guys together as fast as humanly possible. So, again, chemistry, man, chemistry. That's what we're talking about. You look at Miami, they're, they're set. They've got about everybody back for next year. Norchad O'Meara's back. Isaiah Wong's back. Nigel Pack is back. They've got the, the three-headed monster back, uh, I noticed. Great. So, we've got to take a quick break. We've got a little bit more coming up here on Indiana Sports Speed Radio. Stay with us. Brought to you by Courtroom Sports Grill in Bedford. With a great, great Cajun cuisine, great place to catch a game, take the family for dinner, or meet friends for lunch. Back with more right after this. We'll be right back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. If you're in the... All right. Um, what was I going to say? You'll have about four, four and a half minutes to wrap up here. Um, is uh, is Colin Hartman still coming on this week? Has that been confirmed? Well, when was that supposed to be? It was supposed to, or I suggested Wednesday at nine fifty or not nine fifty, nine ten slash and or nine thirty. And if so, I was going to give Kyle Ned and Rip a break. Since high school basketball is done, I will uh, reach out to him. I haven't announced yet that Dusty's going to be on with us Friday, have I? You just did to the YouTube audience. <laughs> well, I know that, but I meant to the radio audience. Yeah, now you can, that, that's a good tease for the end of the show, though. Got the Masters uh, tomorrow. I, I should have. Got... Jim Nance is he still doing the Masters? Yes, I should have got Jeff Schroeder 
on tomorrow at 10 10. No, but Rick Rick Moses is on. Never mind. Never mind. Uh let's see. <sighs> Supposed to have Miller Cop getting lined up to come on the show at some point soon at DB's. Uh, let's Is he going to try to play overseas, or what? What's he going to do? I have no idea. He'll probably go into business, man. He has he has a degree from the Kelly School. No, there you go. Uh, who am I trying to text? Damn it, Colin Hartman. About tomorrow at 9, 10, and or oh, 9, 30. You're usually right here. Where'd you go? YouTube getting Damn a little it. behind the scenes action between this segment. Come on, brother. Come on. All right. 45 seconds. Tomorrow. Who's in front of him? Oh, um, 9, 30 would definitely be better. Yeah, Kravitz is at eight fifty. Just give him either option, though. Don't make, don't limit him to one option. But tell me your, your preference if you have one. All right, here we go. Twenty seconds. Passion for beer, food, and custom metal art. Check out their custom growlers. Metalworks Brewing Company has an updated menu, new brews, and will be offered in all Endeavor Hospitality restaurants. Come taste with Doctor Hops's Brewing Metalworks Brewing Company. Bring your passion and your thirst. This segment is brought to you by K Bello. Now back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Endeavor Hospitality Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here from high atop the 18th fairway at the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios. I did play a little golf yesterday, about nine holes, if you can call it that. I was out there by myself. I played uh, a little top golf yesterday. Oh, yes. Not real golf at all. We're going to talk about that. Um, I, there was, what hole was it? There, I, I'm trying to think what hole I was hitting into. It was, oh, the eighth, um, where I was playing. It's long and kind of uphill. But you're staring directly into the sun at this particular time Oof. of day. And I hit two shots and i'm like i'm just like i was by myself so i'm like man it felt good but i've recently just started hitting the ball straight and so i just started driving out out there and finally there it was i'm like yes hit it straight hit it well so yeah it was fun i still suck but it was still fun. Um, tomorrow on the program, Bob Kravitz. Looking forward to talking to Bob about everything that has transpired and is about to transpire. I believe Colin Hartman should be joining us um, tomorrow as well. And Rick Bozich. Another great lineup. Incredible. The Masters begins this week. Of course, it's already started as far as the, the, the activities and all that. It, it gets underway officially on Thursday. I think they have the part three tomorrow um, and all of that. I'm going to have to reach out to Fuzzy, see if he's available. Uh, I'm sure he's going down for the champion's dinner. Um, what else? Zach Eady, does he stay or does he go? There's, I, I don't see – there's no reason for him to go because he's not uh, – I, I don't know. He he can't – NIL-wise, he's Canadian, so he's getting screwed um, on that, which I kind of don't have an issue with that because the first thing I think of is Marshall and their soccer team. Uh, there was another team that I saw – a different team, but they did not have a single American on it. Uh, and, I, and I'm like, now that's where I draw the line, man. That that's just BS. Um, but anyway, that's Zach Eady. He's not going anywhere. Purdue is going to be back. 
with that same team next year, mostly. But how are they going to be any different, any better, other than the guards being a little bit better? Zach Eady's not going to get better. So Purdue is going to remain the same beatable team, in my opinion. One minute. Indiana has to do what they have to do. We all know that and get the right players in. Fun day, fun conversations with Mike DeCourcy, as always, from the Sporting News, Chronic Hoosier. We didn't get to talk about Top Golf. Damn it. John, what's a Top Golf yesterday? Well, we'll have to do that tomorrow. Uh, we we want to hear how. It was bad. Enjoyable. It was fun, but I'm bad at it. That's the, the short see, end of it. That's But that's the fun part of it. We need video. That. We need to see that stuff. <laughs> Hey, big thanks to everybody on board. Appreciate everybody listening down on the ref. Always the right call. 97.7 ESPN in Evansville on the river. Our folks up in Northwest Indiana and Chicago uh, on WJOB, 1230 AM, 104.7 FM. Wherever you're listening and however you're listening, we appreciate you. And we're back here tomorrow to do it again. For John, the producer, I'm Jim Coyle. I will see you on the radio. Thanks for listening to Indiana Sports Beat Radio. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page for more clips and team coverage of Indiana basketball, football, and more. You can also find full episodes and tons of other content on thehoosier.com. We'll see you next time for another edition of Indiana Sports Beat Radio.